1730, around the Norfolk and Princess Anne counties of Virginia, a rumor began to grow that the King of England had decreed that all enslaved men and women would be freed, pending their baptism into Christianity. Unfortunately, this rumor was not true, and much to the chagrin of the colonial governor, its origin could not be found. But no matter who or why the rumor began, it spread so rapidly through the community of enslaved men and women that their once seemingly hopeless desire for freedom gave way to action. That fall, two Congolese men who had converted to Christianity led more than 200 enslaved Africans in an uprising against the Virginia planters. But the local militia responded quickly in suppressing what would become known as the Chesapeake Rebellion. Tragically, 29 people were hanged on that violent day in 1730. But their sacrifice was not entirely in vain, as several hundred men, women, and children successfully fled to their freedom in the nearby Dismal Swamp, where over the following years, they would bravely transform this treacherous, inhospitable piece of earth into a home for themselves and their families for generations to come. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you are listening to Southern Gothic. The ominously named Great Dismal Swamp is located along the coastal plain region of southeastern Virginia and northwestern North Carolina. This environmental wonder is a diverse habitat that has served as home to a wide array of biodiversity for over 10,000 years. The overwhelming presence of cypress and cedar, along with the dense underbrush of vegetation, give the swamp a unique and mysterious atmosphere. Small islands of dry land rise up from the swamp's water table to heights no more than 10 feet, and the center of this ecological wonder is a natural, circular freshwater lake that covers more than 3,000 acres but reaches a depth of no more than six feet. Lake Drummond, as it is known today, was named in honor of North Carolina's first governor, William Drummond, who in 1665 was recorded as the first European to discover this unique body of water in the depths of the swamp. At this time, the swamp covered nearly 2,000 square miles and was the home of Algonquin-speaking native tribes. But archaeological evidence suggests that this region was inhabited by varying human cultures for more than 13,000 years before the Europeans arrived. It is believed that William Byrd II, a wealthy Virginia planter, gave the swamp its modern name in 1728, when he led a survey team through its dense environs to establish the boundary between the Virginia and North Carolina colonies. Byrd's survey of the swamp included descriptions of the geography, vegetation, and lack of animal life found in the area. But what is most telling is that none of his observations of the swamp are favorable. He describes the region specifically as a horrible desert and writes that as a person travels further into the swamp, quote, no beast or bird approaches, nor so much as an insect or a reptile, nor indeed do any birds care to fly over it. In addition, he observed that noxious vapors that caused illness were present throughout. 
As a result, William Byrd concluded that the swamp, which he directly identified as the Dismal, was of no value to the crown and its natural condition, but it did have the potential to be very useful if it was drained and made into land for farming. Eventually, William Byrd's travel journals were published under the title The History of the Dividing Line Betwixt Virginia and North Carolina. But this work contained more than merely unpleasant descriptions of the Great Dismal Swamp. It also mentioned human inhabitants encountered during this journey. A mixed-race family living roughly half a mile from the edge of the swamp's forest line whose members explained to the colonists that they were free men. Byrd expressed skepticism towards them, as he believed, like many at the time, that enslaved men sought shelter with poor whites living in the area. But he still included their explanation in his journal, which may in fact be one of the earliest works documenting Africans, people of African descent, living in the swamp. But as we know today, this family that Bird encountered was not the first to make their home there, and certainly not the last. Modern studies have estimated that thousands of escaped Africans and the resultant descendants made the Great Dismal Swamp their home between 1630 and 1865. And today, these individuals are known collectively as the Great Dismal Swamp Maroons, a term likely related to the Spanish word Cimarron, meaning wild or untamed, and was used at the time to refer to runaways or castaways. So when the men and women of the Chesapeake Rebellion enter the swamp in 1730, there's little doubt that they were aware of others who'd gone before them. But what made this new community of escaped men and women so unique was not only its size, but also that it was the first to be composed solely of people of African descent, entirely free of reliance on the indigenous tribes who came before them. The next significant group of inhabitants came at the end of the American Revolution. In October of 1775, Joseph Harris, an enslaved man of mixed race who served as a pilot on the Chesapeake Bay, presented himself to Lord Dunmore, Virginia's last royal governor, and pledged himself to the British cause in exchange for his freedom. Dunmore accepted, and in return, he not only gained Harris's extensive knowledge of the waterway, but also hundreds of formerly enslaved men inspired by Harris to fight for their freedom. As a result, at the end of the war, more than 400 of these freed men, known as Dunmore's Ethiopian Regiment, sailed away from Virginia with the British. Yet not all of these freed people left. Some chose to take refuge in the Dismal Swamp, following the example of the Chesapeake rebels before them. Given that the men and women of the Great Dismal Swamp had few personal possessions, there's little modern insight to what day-to-day -day life had been like for the families who resided there. It is known, though, that they made their homes on the islands that rose above the wet swamp floor, and it is entirely possible that they may have interacted with the swamp's long-established Native American communities for some assistance. Due to the inherent risk of leaving the swamp, they relied almost entirely on the resources that could be made and recycled from the habitat itself. 
including tools and other materials left behind by others. Modern archaeological research has located some of these stone tools and shards with evidence of being reworked along with low-fired ceramics and green shards of bottled glass. Historians believe that this isolated self-reliance earned the community a, quote, semi-free existence, though exactly how much independence they had is still a topic of debate. It is known, however, that there was an economic relationship between the Maroons and the Whites who lived in the area. As long as the Maroons were willing to work, the Whites would exchange goods with them and ignore any potential fugitive status. And perhaps oddly, the company that the inhabitants of the Dismal were most likely to work with was one that also operated slave camps there, known initially as the Dismal Swamp Company. In 1763, George Washington visited the Dismal Swamp and established with several others the Dismal Swamp Company, whose goal was to clear the swamp and transform it into land suitable for settlement and farming. So the company established both a town and plantation to begin their task. The farm, named the Dismal Plantation, boasted a population of 54 enslaved persons, all overseen by Washington's younger brother, John Augustine Washington. But in addition to farming, these enslaved men were forced to dig an irrigation ditch, three feet deep and 10 feet wide, that extended five miles from the plantation into the swamp to Lake Drummond. So for the next two decades, these men dug ditches and felled trees. But the company soon encountered a persistent problem their enslaved laborers were escaping. In an effort to curb such flight, the company's shareholders believed an increased number of women would reduce the men's desire to flee. But as can be expected, the increased female population had little effect. By the onset of the American Revolution, it became clear that the Dismal Swamp Company's mission to drain the swamp would not be successful. With the investors' focus elsewhere and white laborers off fighting, the enslaved population of the Dismal Plantation were left with little oversight. Few records remain detailing the activities of those years, but overall, little work was done. In fact, some records show that agents were able to do little to enforce or compel the enslaved workforce to do much of anything. And for a time, the Dismal Plantation was somewhat of its own maroon community. Then, in 1784, the Dismal Swamp Company pivoted from its mission to drain the swamp and began to focus on cutting a canal through it. The work of the newly minted Dismal Swamp Canal Company lasted from 1793 to 1805 and involved several hundred enslaved workers chopping dense underbrush, felling trees, digging up root systems, and carving their way through the swamp's boggy ground. They created 22 miles of waterway, and to this day, their work remains the oldest continuously operating man-made canal in the United States. When the canal was completed in 1814, the company once again reincorporated, this time as the Dismal Swamp Land Company, which focused its profits solely on lumber making its money from a range of products, but especially its wooden shingles. In 
Yet the success of this company relied heavily on the establishment of slave labor camps within the swamp. And while the conditions of work in these camps could best be described as horrendous, the situation became similar to that of the former Dismal Plantation, as the enslaved men received minimal oversight, allowing them some collective power to negotiate their pace of work. A first-hand account of life as a company slave can be found in the narrative of Moses Grandy, who was born an enslaved man around 1786, but eventually managed to purchase his freedom. In the work, which was first published in London in 1843 and reprinted in Boston the following year by abolitionist Oliver Johnson, Grandy recounted the treacherous working conditions. He described that the ground was often very boggy and the men were often covered, quote, up to the middle or much deeped in mud and water as they worked. He described that this continued on for as long as they were able to keep their heads above water. And for shelter, the men camped in huts made of shingles and boards and were often forced to sleep beside a fire to ward off the swamp's many insects. Occasionally, company agents or overseers would distribute tobacco or other approved rations as an enticement to the men. But the work was downright inhumane. As a result, Grandy chose to maroon himself in the dismal, yet he continued working as a shingle-getter and bartered with the enslaved men for goods whenever the opportunity arose. Fortunately, Grandy was eventually able to make an agreement to purchase his freedom and was able to leave the swamp for good. In November of 1836, Edward Ruffin, a Virginian slaveholder and company man, visited one of the camps in the dismal. He recorded that the camp was occupied by a pair of shingle-getters in a shanty-type shelter typical of these camps. The shelter was large enough to fit perhaps six men and it had a roof no more than four feet off the ground that slanted to one side so rainwater could drain. Inside, the men slept on wood shavings, the waste produced from making shingles. Ruffin claimed that these enslaved men often met their weekly quotas for producing shingles in only four or five days and would then take advantage of the lack of supervision by spending the remaining time out in the swamp, quote, given to idleness and drunkenness. While Ruffin certainly did not approve of these events, it seems unlikely he knew that within the swamp, it wasn't just enslaved men making the shingles. As an internal economy had risen there between the growing population of maroons and enslaved men, forcing the success of the company to be reliant upon the exchange of goods and services with these communities of free men and women. And it is believed that in some cases, maroons in the swamp even worked as shingle-getters, as off-the-books employees for the company. One such man who worked illegally for the company in the dismal was Charlie, who fled enslavement and lived as a maroon in the swamp for a time before continuing on to freedom in Canada. Charlie's story was first published in 1859 by James Redpath in the work, The Roving Editor, or Talks with Slaves in the Southern States. It is noted in this book that Charlie's story was written down verbatim from his narration by a Mrs. Knox of Boston. But for clarity's sake, 
we've modernized some of the language. I boarded with a man who gave me $2 a month for the first one. After that, I made shingles for myself. And there are a heap of folks in there to work. Most of them are fugitives, dreadfully accommodating to one another. They each like the advantage of the other one's protection. And they're united together individually with the same interests at stake. I've never heard one of them speak disrespectfully to one another. Charlie was just one of the many men who's believed to have worked for the company off the books while living freely in the swamp communities there. For his efforts, he received $2 a month in pay, which allowed him to eventually travel north to Canada. But while the Great Dismal Swamp was merely a single stop on his path to freedom, he wrote very highly of the community. There are families who grew up in the Dismal Swamp that have never seen a white man and would be scared to see one. Some runaways went there with their wives and their children were raised there. By the 1840s, the men and women of the Great Dismal Swamp began to gather the attention of the abolitionist movement. In 1848, Frederick Douglass's North Star reprinted a report titled Slaves in the Dismal Swamp, noting that the swamp was worthy of attention because it harbored a, quote, city of refuge for the poor slave, and that hundreds of fugitives populated the swamps, a land so inaccessible that some who lived there had never even seen a white man. Several novels also brought attention to the maroon population and the dismal, including William Wells Brown's Clotel, published in 1853. In it, his protagonists interact with the famed Nat Turner and his followers from inside the dismal swamp as they plan the 1831 rebellion. Frederick Douglass's 1853 work, The Heroic Slave, also uses the setting as his protagonist, a woman named Madison Washington, spends five years hiding in a cave there. Most notably, though, is famed writer Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel, Dread, a tale of the Great Dismal Swamp, first serialized between December 1855 through September 1856. This tale was based on stories of Nat Turner and his followers' retreat into the swamp following their failed rebellion. But while Turner was frequently used as a plot point in many of these works, there is no actual evidence that places him or his followers there. However, it is believed to have been a concern of white Virginians following Nat Turner's well-known rebellion that the men who survived retreated into the dismal to plan further revolts. The maroon communities of the Great Dismal Swamp are believed to have lasted over 200 years, from the mid-17th century to the mid-1860s, its end coinciding with the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation and completion of the Civil War. Unfortunately, significant research and archaeological work into the area has only truly taken off in the last two decades leaving many questions to be answered. As a result, little physical evidence has yet to have been found to help understand the culture of the Great Dismal Swamp Maroons. And to date, no human remains or even cemeteries have been located there. But the documentary evidence and first-hand accounts of people like Moses Grandy and Charlie confirmed that these communities did in fact exist. Self-reliantly thriving in this inhospitable habitat while enjoying the freedom that at the time only this impenetrable wilderness would allow them.
My name is Brandon Schecksnyder, and you've been listening to Southern Gothic. Southern Gothic is an independently released podcast, written and produced by Brianne and Brandon Schecksnyder. This week's episode includes a special guest voiceover by Howard Garrett. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter. Not only will you help us sustain our growth and continue releasing episodes like this one, but you'll receive access to special members-only content and swag. The link is in the show notes. Lucky Lady Shacks.